Good evening to each one. So good to be with you on this Lord's Day once again to worship our Heavenly Father in spirit and truth. We're blessed with visitors once again this evening. Thank you so much for coming our way. Good to see you with us tonight. I invite you to take your Bibles out, please. Open to the Old Testament, to the book of Exodus, please. Exodus chapter 8. Exodus 8, we'll read verses 1 through 15 together, please. And the Lord spoke to <clears throat> Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go, that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all your territory with frogs, so the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into your house, into your bedroom, on your bed, into the houses of your servants, on your people, into your ovens, into your kneading bowls. The frogs shall come up on you and on your people and on all your servants. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, say to Aaron, Stretch out your hand with your rod over the streams, over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs on the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people. And I will let the people go that they may sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses said to Pharaoh, Accept the honor of saying when I shall intercede for you, for your servants and for your people, to destroy the frogs from you and your houses that they remain in the river only. So he said, Tomorrow. And he said, let it be according to your word, that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. And the frogs shall depart from you, from your houses, from your servants, and from your people. They shall remain in the river only. Then Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried out to the Lord concerning the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. So the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the courtyards, and out of the fields. They gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart, and did not heed them as the Lord had said. Back in verse 8, after Pharaoh had enough, and notice his magicians supposedly were able with their enchantments to bring up frogs and land. They were not able to remove them. Whatever they were able to do, they weren't able to do that. And so when Pharaoh and his people had enough, and I wouldn't think it would take very long to have enough of frogs all over the place, especially in your bedroom and in your bed with you, uh, that he entreated, notice in verse 8, he says, entreat to Moses there, and he said, entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and my, from my people, and, and I will let the people go that they may sacrifice the Lord. Okay, okay, I've had enough. And Moses said, all right, basic, okay, when do you want the frogs taken away? Verse 10, tomorrow. Tomorrow. If that were you, when would you want the frogs taken away? The ladies, when would you want the frogs taken away from your bedroom and your kitchen? All right. Um, Right away, right? What was, what on earth was Pharaoh thinking to say tomorrow? Wouldn't you want your house and land rid of those pests immediately? Not tomorrow, but now. Well, whatever the reason or thinking was in Pharaoh's mind, he chose to spend one more night with the frogs. And by doing so, he allowed time for his heart 
to harden once again, to harden even more against God and against his will. So I want us to think about that for a little while this evening in our lesson. One more night with the frogs. You know, Pharaoh and his people were living their lives at this time in rebellion to God and to God's will. God's very clear instructions to the king of Egypt was to let my people go that they may go into the wilderness and they may serve me, they may sacrifice to me. And his refusal to obey the voice of the Lord, in fact, he would say, who is the Lord that I should obey? His voice. Well, he would find out through the course of these 10 plagues who the Lord was that he should listen and heed the voice of the Lord. But time and time again, he refused to obey. And so with the plague of the frogs, he said, tomorrow, I will heed God's command and God's instruction tomorrow. In other words, just one more night of sin, one more night of living in rebellion to God's will. And, and that's exactly how many people, sadly, live their lives in this world below when it comes to their sin and getting their life right with God. They delay, they procrastinate, they harden their heart through the deceitfulness of sin. Sadly, that's how some of God's people I have observed, and obviously you have too in the Bible, but also just in life experiences, that's how some of God's people live their lives at times too, by holding on to some sinful habit, sinful conduct in their lives just a little bit longer until they change, until they make things right with God. You know, for some, maybe it's just one more night of fornication, one more night of sexual morality, and then I'll get my life right. Then I'll turn away from it. Then I will repent. Obviously, this is rampant, the sin of fornication in the world we live in, and it always has been. Maybe it seems that evil men and imposters wax worse and worse, as the Scripture says. But in Ephesians 5 and verse 5, it says, For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance, in the kingdom of Christ and God. It goes on to say, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. So even in the, the context of fornication, unclean, being unclean, being covetous, and idolater, won't inherit the kingdom of God. He said, the warning there is don't let no one deceive you that you can participate in these things and that's going to be okay. No, that's the very reason God's wrath is coming upon the sons of disobedience. You know, there was a statement made by Paul here in 2 Corinthians to saints, to Christians about fornication. And obviously we know that there was one man from the first epistle, 1 Corinthians 5, that was guilty of sexual morality and the church was guilty of harboring that sin in their midst. They address it, evidently, after Paul rebuked them. But notice he alludes and brings up fornication here in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 20. Let's back up to verse 20, include it with 21. He says, For I fear lest when I come I shall not find you such as I wish, and I shall be found by you such as you do not wish, lest there be contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbitings, whisperings, conceits, tumults, lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before and have not repented. Notice of the uncleanness, fornication, and lewdness which they have practiced. So Paul has a concern that some among the saints at Corinth still are participating in sins such as fornication, that you still haven't got that rid of that from your life. Well, 
You think back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 when he listed fornication and adultery and homosexuality and, 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 and sodomites and then he says such were some of you. Well evidently such maybe were present are some of them. And so it does, yeah it's in the world but we know that this has plagued the children of God as well and sometimes we can act just like Pharaoh for not careful. Just, just one more night. Just one more night of sin, one more night with the frogs, and, and then I'll, I, I'll, I'll do right. I'll listen to God. Right? And that's what that was all about. The plagues was to cause Pharaoh to stop hardening his heart, to relent and, and obey God, let my people go. And he would. Just one more night of adultery, and then I'll be faithful. Of course, Jesus addressed the subject of marriage, divorce, remarriage in Matthew chapter 19. And he was asked by the Pharisees who tested him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? He said, have you not read? He took him back to Genesis 2. Have, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Verse 6 so then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. Later he would say in verse 9, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. And yet many ignore what Jesus says here. Obviously there are some who are ignorant of God's will, but there are many who are not, who ignore it, who reject it, and know exactly what Jesus teaches here on the subject of marriage, divorce, and remarriage, that there's one exception for a scriptural cause of divorce, and otherwise to put away a spouse not for the cause of sexual immorality and to marry another uh, is, to, is to place both of those uh, mates in an unlawful, unscriptural, adulterous marriage. And there's many who choose to do that with that knowledge of the sin that they're in. Marriage, we know, is honorable among all the beds undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers, Hebrews 13, 4, God will judge. Just one more night of viewing pornography. And then I'll stop. And then I'll put it away. No more after that. The psalmist says in Psalm 101, and you might want to hold your place in Matthew if you're still there, but Psalm 101 and in verse 3, and this is the sweet psalmist David who wrote many of the course of the Psalms, but he declared, I will set nothing wicked or worthless before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away, it shall not cling to me. I'll set nothing wicked before my eyes. Well, pornography is definitely wicked. It's filthy. It's of the sensuality, sensual sins that many are caught up in and even at times the people of God form an addiction to pornography. But we can go back to it and say, well, just one more time. Then I'll, then I'll stop. One more night of sin. One more night with the frogs. Jesus said to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 28. Matthew 5 verse 28, But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So much of the sin of pornography is right here in verse 28. Looking upon another lusting for one in his or her heart. Just one more night of sin. Just one more night of drinking. And then I'll put it away for good. The book of Proverbs has a lot to say about the dangers of intoxicating drink. In Proverbs chapter 20, for example. Proverbs chapter 20, I realize that's not on the screen, but you hear the sound of my voice. <laughs> so Proverbs chapter 20. 20, verse 1, wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Now coming to chapter 23, 
verses 29 through 35. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long at the wine, those who go in search of mixed wine. Do not look at the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last it bites like a serpent, stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. Yes, you'll be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea or like one who lies at the top of the mast saying, They have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. When shall I wake that I may seek another drink? How many in this world have given themselves over to the addiction of alcohol? Many. And has destroyed their lives and destroyed their families. And the Bible has warning after warning about it. In chapter 31 of Proverbs, even at the very end of the book, again, there's warnings about drinking. Notice in verses 4 through 7, verses 4 through 7, it is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine. This is the mother to King Lemuel. It's not for princes, nor for princes intoxicating drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the justice of all the afflicted. Give strong drink to him who is perishing, and wine to those who are bitter of heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. And yet, there continues to be members of the Lord's church who want to defend drinking alcohol. Well, not to that extent, not to the Proverbs 23 extent, of course. Sometimes what's referred to as social drinking. But, you know, it's not always social. Sometimes it's maybe private. Sometimes it's maybe in one's own home. But just a little bit, just a little bit, not too much. We had, a, had an article in the bulletin, not too long ago, recently, just one drink that I wrote, and uh, I hope you, especially the members here, read that, noticed that, just one drink and what it will do to a person's mind and the body and ability, just one drink. We're talking about intoxicating drink, we're talking about that kind of wine that the Bible describes, because the Bible speaks of wine, you have to look at the context, is, is, is this talking about intoxicating wine, is this talking about grape juice? Oinos, the Greek word for wine, is, is, is used for both. And so you always have to study the context. Obviously, the passages we're looking at, we're talking about the wine, the, the drink that the Bible condemns that we need to have nothing to do with at all. Just, just a little bit's okay, is it? Just a little bit of sin is okay. Just one more night of sin. Just one more night of a bad temper. Then I'll practice self-control. Then I'll get a hold of my emotions. Well, one of the things that we're to do in putting on the new man, the new woman in Christ Jesus is to put off the various sinful things of the flesh, one of which is sinful anger, such as we read in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 31, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, which is loud quarreling, loud arguing, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Oftentimes people who have a tendency to lose control of their emotions and lash out angrily, they have this bad temper, often justify it. Uh, others sometimes justify, well, that's just the way he is or that's the way she is. Well, that's not the way a Christian is to be. It's not the way that I'm supposed to be or you, do, you are to be. And we have to get rid of that. We can't continue to tolerate that, put up with that, because God certainly doesn't. Just one more night of pursuing riches, and then I'll be content with all the things that God has so richly blessed me with. That's the problem for those who desire to be rich and the love of money. They don't realize and recognize and stop to think, God has met my needs, and I'm content with food and clothing. That's what we read in Verse 6 and 7 and 8 of 1 Timothy 6, that when we have those things, the necessities of life, be content. That godliness with contentment, that's great gain. 
and to just stop and, and thank God for our blessings. It's okay to be blessed with, with, with money. It's okay to be successful in life and do well. But there's certainly dangers that the Bible warns us of throughout the Old and New Testament of riches. But here in verse 9 it says, but those who desire to be rich. That's what they're focused on. That's what they want. They're chasing the the dollar and the next dollar. They fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. We stop, pause. We see that all the time in the world, don't we? You can almost trace all these different sins back to what? Money money, the pursuit of the money. Verse 10, though, it affects God's people, doesn't it? For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith. Now we're not talking about non-Christians. We're not talking about those in the world. We're talking about us. We're talking about members of the Lord's church for which some have strayed from the faith and their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Just one more night of rebelling against God's will in my life is such a foolish position to take that Pharaoh took on behalf of Egypt. One more night with the frogs. You think about the attitude of that. You know, the frogs aren't that bad, really. Really? (laughs) You... You look back at what we started off in Exodus chapter 8. And where were the frogs at? Well, God brought them up abundantly out of all the water sources. Obviously the Nile River. But also the streams and the ponds and other rivers. It wasn't just the Nile River. And verse 3, where were they going to be? They're going to go up into your house. They're going to be in your bedroom. They're going to be on your bed. They're going to be in the houses of your servants. They're not going to escape either. They're going to be on your people. Okay, not just with you. They're going to be on your people. And they're going to also be, think about opening up your oven. There they are, leaping out at you. They're going to be in your ovens. And when you're needing something, getting getting a meal ready, they're going to jump in it. They're going to be in your kneading bowls, right? You got that pictured? That's that's what we read earlier in Exodus chapter 8. And and the frogs shall come up on you, on your people, and all your servants. And then remember when they died off, the plague ended, the aftermath, the consequences of, of, of what was left, Remember? There in verses 13 through 15, so the Lord did according to the word of Moses. And the frogs died out of the houses, out of the courtyards, out of the fields. They gathered them together in heaps. You just got these large heaps of dead frogs. And what did it do to the land? The land stank, right? It, it, it was a t- horrible smell. You think about, <laughs> maybe don't want to think about it, how bad a just one animal that's died smells, and you got heaps of dead carcasses of frogs all over the place. But, verse 15 of Exodus 8, when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, okay, it's over. We got through it. Then he what? Then he hardened his heart and did not heed them as the Lord had said. Right? It's not that bad. Okay, it's over. Well, that was rough to get through, but it's over. You know, we have a couple references in the book of Psalms that we're studying on Sunday morning. We got so much to cover, Jason. We don't don't have time to probably spend too much on this. But in Psalm 105, verse 30, their land abounded with frogs, even in the chambers of their kings. In Psalm 78 and verse 45, it says, He sent swarms of flies among them, which devoured them, and frogs, which destroyed them. So that was Psalm 105, verse 30, and Psalm 78, verse 45, if you're taking notes, where even the psalmists make reference to this story from Exodus chapter 8. Oh, it was bad. But sometimes when... The rough part is over. We're like, well, our memory may be short. It wasn't that bad. Well, what about us? 
You know, that's the problem with so many people today. They do not take their sin all that seriously, do they? They do not hate sin. In fact, Paul describes somehow they have a greediness for sin. They go after it greedily, Ephesians chapter 4. The attitude we're supposed to have, Romans 12, 9, is abhor what is evil, yet many embrace what is evil. They don't realize how sin enslaves them and destroys their soul. In fact, they not only tolerate sin in their lives, they rather enjoy it. Remember Hebrews 11, verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy what? The passing pleasures of sin. Is there pleasure to sin? Yeah, it's fleeting, it's temporary, it's not truly satisfying whatsoever. But what, where's the temptation if there's not some kind of fleshly, worldly enjoyment, right? You know what so many don't understand is that sin will take you further than you, you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you want to pay. A lot of people don't know that, realize that, recognize that, and oftentimes until it's too late. But of course, we know that all sin is bad. Sin is transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. And as Paul said in Romans 3, 23, and go ahead and turn to Romans. We have a few verses we want to read there. But Paul said, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then in Romans chapter 6, Romans 6, verses 16 and 17. He asked, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin? And where does it lead? It leads to death. Or of obedience. Of course, obedience to God. That leads to righteousness. He says, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. You were what? You were one time slaves, servants of sin. You know, that's exactly what Jesus' point was in John 8. Oftentimes we, we quote what Jesus said in John 8, 32, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free or make you free. You remember how the Jews responded to that statement? We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone, which was, of course, ridiculous. What are we reading about tonight? Kind of the 400-year bondage in Egypt, right? And many other occasions where they were, in fact, at that time, who was ruling over them? The Roman Empire. But anyways, they're thinking physical enslavement. Jesus is always up here on a spiritual plane. He's talking about spiritual enslavement. And he goes on and says in John 8, 34, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And so what does sin do? It causes me to fall short of the glory of God. I transgressed against his law, right? I commit it, I become a slave to it. That's what I'm practicing in my life. And reemphasized in verse 23, for the wages, the payment I receive, you receive, anybody receives, for our sins against God is death. Our sins separate us from our holy God, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. And of course, our sins we require Jesus dying on the cross, suffering and dying on the cross to be saved. When you think about that, how can we possibly take sinning against God lightly? You know, later the, the Hebrew writer will speak of those who sin willfully after they receive the knowledge of the truth and what they're doing to Jesus Christ as a result. They're trampling the Son of God underfoot. And as he stated earlier in Hebrews chapter 6, how they crucify again for themselves the Son of God. Peter, in 2 Peter, when he, he speaks of giving all diligence to add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control godliness, to godliness 
perseverance to perseverance, brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness, love. And he talks about if you, if you, if you do these things, you'll be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness, and he has forgotten what? He's forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. You've forgotten that you're cleansed from your old sins if these are not the things you're pursuing, spiritually speaking. Well, you're not appreciating the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and, and what, it, what, it, what it cost him, what it cost God, what was required in order to purchase you, redeem you from your sins. So often we, we don't take sin seriously. Ah, my sin's not that bad. And we can fall in that trap, can we? And not appreciate anywhere close that we should to what Jesus endured and went through for us. Of course, sin that is unrepented of will cost you your soul. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will likewise perish. In the second sermon that Peter preached, recorded for us by Luke in Acts 3, 19, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. When Paul was in Athens, Greece, and preaching to those who did not know the true, one true and living God. He said to them in verse 30 of Acts 17, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now He commands all men everywhere to repent, because He has appointed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom He has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising Him from the dead. There's a judgment day coming. There was a judgment day coming for Egypt in the form of the ten plagues and ultimately with the final one of the death of the firstborn and that's what broke his back that pierced his heart enough to finally relent but even after that he hardened his heart and pursued them at the Red Sea to his and his army's demise in the midst of the Red Sea. But the reason we must concern ourselves with not accepting one more night with the frogs, one more night of sin, and my, my sin's not really that bad. It's not like others out here. Sometimes we do that. Well, it's not like that guy or that person. We need to realize the danger, the spiritual danger that we're living in every moment we continue in that sin and don't, do not turn from it and repent. There's a judgment day coming. We don't know when that judgment day is coming. You know, it was as if as Pharaoh and his servants were saying, I'll, I'll listen to God tomorrow. Moses and Aaron, come before me. Entreat the Lord to remove the frogs from the land. All right. When would you like that? Well, tomorrow. That's when I'll listen to God tomorrow. James chapter 4, verse 14, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. How many have that same sort of thinking tomorrow. That's the day. Not today, but tomorrow, later. Well, as James points out, and many verses in the Bible point out to us, tomorrow may never come for you or me, right? We are reminded of that on a regular basis in the world that we live, how fragile life is, how uncertain life is. You remember the the rich fool that Jesus tells us of in Luke chapter 12, and he's got all these grand plans for the future. He's, had a, he's been successful with his business, and this rich man, the ground of a certain rich man, it yielded plentifully. In verse 17, he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I'll pull down my barns. I'll build greater. And there I'll store all my crops and goods, and I'll say to my soul, So you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night, 
See, that wasn't even tomorrow. That was that day. He, was, he had plans for many years, right? Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? Verse 21, here's the main point. Jesus tells us, so is he who lays up treasure for himself is not rich toward God. So many people, God is not on their radar. He's not, he's not their focus in their life. They're not living for him. They don't know his will. They're not seeking to know his will. They're living for themselves, the here and now. There's no thought about eternity and judgment and what's to come. And so he didn't even have tomorrow. Full this night, your soul will be required of you. Where would you spend eternity if your life came to an end tonight? You see, if I was in the audience, you go back to 1990, 91, early 92, and the preacher asked the question, and I was in the audience at that age, I would know the answer, and it wouldn't be heaven. In Acts chapter 24, Acts chapter 24, and again, the reason for that, going back to what I just said, was because I had not yet obeyed the gospel, and I knew what I needed to do. But it was still, it was tomorrow, it was later. I put it off, I procrastinated. And it could have cost me my soul. Acts chapter 24, verses 24 and 25, And after some days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. In other words, he heard the gospel presented. What specifically? Well, Paul, he reasoned with Felix and Drusilla and those present about righteousness, self-control, the judgment to come. The very thing we just read about in Acts 17 that Paul preached in Athens. You need to repent. There's a judgment day coming. Get your life right with God. It affected Felix. Felix was afraid. He was frightened and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I'll call for you. As the New American Standard Bible says, When I find time, I'll call for you. Later, not now. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe next month. Maybe in another year or so. Well, don't be like Felix, friend, and procrastinate obedience to the gospel. When it comes to the salvation of your soul, your eternal soul, as we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, but now. But many who hear the truth of the gospel, they express similar good intentions. Spiritual procrastination will often lead, though, to a more hardened heart. It gets harder it gets harder, and I'm speaking from personal experience with this, the longer you wait and delay and put it off. And there's a danger there of reaching the point where your heart becomes so hardened, you never do. You need to redeem the time. Why do we spend one more night with a frog? Why do we choose to continue in sin? Next, next week, I'll change my life. Next month, I'll be more faithful in my attendance. Someday, I'll become a Christian. Someday, I'll, uh, tomorrow, I'll get my life right with God. Why do we do that? You know, in Pharaoh's case, one more night with the frogs eventually cost him everything. Will it cost you your soul? Dear friends, please consider the brevity of life, the blessing of time, and the certainty of our appointment with death and judgment, eternity to come. One more night with the frogs might be one night too many. And so why not take the steps of sal of, that lead to salvation? God in his mercy has spared you to this hour. Why hasn't the Lord come yet? Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. He's long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants you and me, if there's sin in our life, 
whether it's a child of God or we haven't yet become a child of God, to come to repentance. And so, for those in the audience who have not yet obeyed the gospel, you know these steps because you've heard them many times. But you have to decide when you're ready to take those steps that you've heard the Son of God and you believe in Him and you are willing to repent of your sins and confess your faith in Him and to be baptized into Christ, to have your sins washed away by His precious blood. If you are subject to the Lord's invitation, would you let it be known as together we stand and we sing.